Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the effect of the sympathetic nervous system on uh, the heart. Okay, so we're trying to now understand the signaling pathway by which uh, noradrenaline acts on cardiomyocytes. Uh, Okay, so we've seen that it binds to these beta-1 adrenergic receptors and activates the GS heterotrimeric G protein so that we now have these alpha S GTP subunits. Okay, and now what's going to happen is these are going to activate adenylyl cyclase enzymes. Okay, now there are two forms of adenylyl cyclase that are in the heart, basically. And these are adenylyl cyclase, adenylyl cyclase 5 and adenylyl cyclase 6. So in cardiomyocytes you have two isoforms of adenylyl cyclase enzyme, adenylyl cyclase 5 and you also have adenylyl cyclase 6. Overall in the human genome I think there are around nine adenylyl cyclases. Yes, I think that's correct. Um, and these two they are encoded for by different genes, but they are very, very similar enzymes, okay? So, in the heart, specifically, you have either adenylyl cyclase 5 or adenylyl cyclase 6. Well, actually, you'll have both, basically. So, henceforth, we will refer to uh, adenylyl cyclase as AC for short, adenylyl cyclase, and then we'll put 5 slash 6. This does not denote that it's a chimera of the two. It denotes that I'm either talking about an adenylyl cyclase 5 enzyme, or the exact same thing holds true of adenylyl cyclase 6 enzymes. So let's have a look at the structure of an adenylyl cyclase enzyme. So the structure of adenylyl cyclase, then, you basically have... Uh, the amino terminus here, so this is the amino terminus of the polypeptide, then it spans the membrane several times, six times here, to form the what's known as the transmembrane domain 1, called TM1. Okay, then it has a loop that's intracellular, and then it has another one of these regions where you span the membrane six times, like so. Okay, and this is known as transmembrane domain 2. And then it has a portion here and then it has its carboxyl terminus over here. Now, this loop between transmembrane domain 1 and transmembrane domain 2, this is known as the C1 portion of the adenylyl cyclase. So this is C1, and C1 can be further divided into two portions, C1A and C1B here, okay? So let me highlight these up. So C1A will denote in purple here, Okay, and C1B will denote in blue here. Okay, similarly, this bit here, which is at the carboxyl end of the enzyme after the transmembrane 2 domain, this is known as C2 portion of the enzyme. And again, C2 can be divided into two portions. It can be divided into C2A, and it can be divided into another portion, C2B. So let me highlight those up as well. So C2A will have in turquoise here, and C2B will have, not in pink, we'll have it in yellow. If yellow shows up, I don't know if it will, uh, hopefully. Okay, C2B is there. Right, okay, so uh, this enzyme is inactive, the way I've drawn it at the moment. This is the inactive enzyme that's sitting in the plasma membrane. Now, the alpha S GTP subunit is going to come and activate it. So how is that going to work? Well, basically, in order for the enzyme to become activated, you actually have to make the functional enzyme. So where is the functional enzyme? Which bit of this is the actual enzyme? It's not these two transmembrane domains, certainly not. They're just there to anchor it in the membrane. It's made by a dimerization of this C1A in pink here and this C2A in turquoise here. You have to bring those two portions together. They have to dimerize, and then they will make the active enzyme. So basically, the way that the alpha S GTP um, so, um, uh, complex works to activate the adenylyl cyclase 5 or the adenylyl cyclase 6 is that it, and this in fact goes for all adenylyl cyclases, not just adenylyl cyclase 5 and 6, the alpha S GTP subunit activates them by binding to the C1A and to the C2A domains and bringing them close together so that they dimerize. So, what's going to happen is if we draw a cartoon for this, here's the 
phospholipid bile there again. Here's the amino terminus of our adenylylcyclase 5 slash adenylylcyclase 6 enzyme. Here is our transmembrane domain 1 here. Okay, then we've got this C1 loop here. Then we've got our second transmembrane domain here. We've got six membrane spanning alpha helices. And now what has happened is this C2A domain has been brought right up against this C1A here so that they are now touching one another and form the active enzyme. Now, how am I going to show the uh, Alfresh GTB bound to both of these? Um, okay, where am I going to show this? So I'll show them kind of, um, I'll just show it as a little pink blob. Right, so C1A is here in pink, okay? C1B is still here in blue. C2A is here in turquoise, and the C1A and the C2A, I hope you can see, I've now dimerized. And C2B is still here in blue down here, oh, sorry, in yellow rather. Carboxyl group is right at the end there. This is transmembrane region 1, and this is transmembrane region 2. Okay, and now I'll just try to draw the um, Alfresh GTP subunit here. So I'll just draw, colour them in so that it looks as though it looks slightly convincing. Okay, so there's the GTP in orange. And here in purple, which is unfortunate because that's the same colour as the C1A, uh, is the uh, Alfres subunit. So basically, the Alfres GTP subunit binds to both of these domains and pulls them together so that they can dimerize and form an active enzyme. Now, once this adenylylcyclase 5 or adenylylcyclase 6 enzyme is active, what it's going to do is it's going to start taking in adenosine triphosphate and it's going to start converting it to cyclic AMP. So let's try and understand what this reaction actually involves. Well, the cartoon structure for adenos uh, adenosine triphosphate then. So let's start with adenosine. Adenosine basically consists of a ribose sugar with an adenine organic base bound to it. So this is adenosine. Adenosine means an adenine organic base, which is this A here, so adenine, uh, the organic base that's incorporated into DNA, bound to a ribose sugar here. So basically, this is not the sort of... Um, subunit that you would put into DNA, because in DNA you have deoxyribose. This is what you would put into RNA, where you have ribose. So this is the ribose sugar here, so this is ribose. And together, adenine and ribose are called adenosine. And adenosine is what's known as a nucleoside, okay? So a nucleoside means an organic base, a DNA organic base, with a ribose sugar. Okay, now to convert it into a nucleotide, uh, what you have to do is add phosphate groups onto the fifth carbon of the nucleoside, well, the ribose sugar of the nucleoside. So a nucleotide basically just means stick phosphate groups off this fifth carbon here. Now, in the case of ATP, we're going to add three phosphate groups off. So it's a triphosphate nucleotide. So these here in red, these are the phosphate groups, free phosphate groups bound off this ribose. And we'll have the ribose in blue here. So this is the ribose, this five-membered ring with a car for the fifth carbon up there, because the first member of the ring at the tip here is not a carbon, it's an oxygen. Okay, and then finally, adenine, the organic base, which is too complicated to draw, so we just draw it as a square. Right. Okay, so this is our cartoon for adenosine triphosphate. So when we added those three phosphate groups onto adenosine, we now logically call it adenosine with three phosphate groups on, so adenosine triphosphate, or ATP for short. Right, and this is going to go into this enzyme, okay, and when it comes out, what instead we're going to have is cyclic adenosine monophosphate, or cyclic AMP. So, what is the structure of cyclic AMP? Well, again, you have adenosine, so we'll start off with adenosine. Okay, so here is our ribose sugar. Here is our adenine organic base here. 
again. So that's the adenosine uh, cyclic, uh, sorry, the adenosine nucleoside so far. Okay, the adenine organic base in turquoise, the ribose sugar here in blue. Okay, and uh, then we want cyclic adenosine monophosphate. So what we need to do is put a single phosphate group off this fifth carbon. So that's adenosine monophosphate. To make it cyclic, the phosphate group then has to be bound also to this third carbon of the ribose ring. So this is the cycle of cyclic adenosine. So that's the nucleoside, the adenine with the ribose. And then monophosphate because you've got a single phosphate group off of it. So it's similar structure to adenosine monophosphate except that in adenosine monophosphate you just basically have this one phosphate sticking off up here and it would have a free end basically it wouldn't be bound to this carbon here so that's why it's called cyclic adenosine monophosphate because you've created this cycle here okay and then what you're also going to get off apart from just cyclic adenosine monophosphate you're also going to get a molecule known as pyrophosphate pyrophosphate, which is often abbreviated to uh, PPI, so PPI for short, and this is basically just the other two phosphate groups that came off the ATP. So here they are, both still bound together. And uh, basically in ATP, this first phosphate group is known as the alpha phosphate, then the next one's the beta phosphate, and the final one's the gamma phosphate. So this pyrophosphate is made up of the beta and the gamma phosphate still bound together, which have been cut off when you uh, reduced ATP to AMP. Okay, right. So, the adenylyl cyclase 5 or 6 has now been activated by our alpha SGTP complex and is now converting uh, ATP into cyclic AMP. Okay, we'll now see the effects of cyclic AMP in the next video.